Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here, once again to cover the history of one of the most popular beat em up games of all time. In the last few weeks, we have looked at the story of the first games within both the Final Fight and Streets of Rage game series. In today's video, we are going to focus on another huge title from the genre, and a game that is fondly remembered as one of Sega's most important releases ever. With all of this said, this is the mad story of Golden Axe, and why it is so important. The year is 1989. The world is just entering into the transitional period between the 8-bit and 16-bit era. In homes in Japan, the 8-bit Famicom still reigns supreme, with the more powerful PC Engine beginning to slightly eat into its market share. In October 1988, Sega released a system that was arguably more powerful than both in the form of the 16-bit Sega Mega Drive. But the system was only launched with two titles, Space Harrier 2 and Super Thunder Blade, so the platform was by no means trailblazing at such a stage. As always, Sega was primarily an arcade gaming company, and had only entered the console hardware market prior in 1983 in a fear that if they did not manage to get a significant home market share, then Nintendo could possibly find enough success at home that they would be able to use their popularity to take away some of Sega's arcade market share. So still, by the late 80s, Sega as a whole were not doing great at home, but were still doing well in the arcades, which served as the company's bread and butter. Speaking of the arcades, 1985 had seen Sega release their early 16-bit arcade system boards, simply known as the Sega System 16. These boards were prolifically used by Sega, so would result in roughly around 40 different games being developed to run off the hardware and its variants. These boards' success was partially due to their durability, assisted by the pairing of a Motorola 68000 CPU with a Zilog Z80 coprocessor. The famous Capcom CP1 board, as well as their SNK Neo Geo board, were both built on the same foundations as this board, and later of course the Sega Mega Drive's in the homes was too. In further regards to these boards, they would feature legendary games debuting on them, such as Shinobi, Altered Beast, and of course the subject of this video, Golden Axe. As you know on this channel, we have previously looked at Final Fight and Streets of Rage. Golden Axe ties these two games' histories together, due to the fact that Streets of Rage came into existence due to the influence of Final Fight, but was created using a modified Golden Axe engine. Golden Axe itself's existence predates that of Final Fight by a few months. However, both games' creators cite Double Dragon as the main influence behind their titles. When it comes to Final Fight, the game took a very direct approach when creating a game influenced by Double Dragon. However, the creation of Golden Axe was a project led by Makota Uchida, who was too inspired by the series but very much decided to head in his own direction with the project. Prior to Golden Axe, Makota had already worked on Altered Beast, a brawler that was mythologically inspired. Just as this project was beginning to be wrapped up, Sega executives asked Makota's team to come up with another new game. Sega's proposition to him was that they wanted him to make an arcade game with gameplay like Double Dragon. From here, Makota thought it was a terrible idea for him to attempt to make a game too much like Double Dragon, because developers of Double Dragon, Technos, were experienced in creating games of that ilk, and had also worked on the Kunio-kun series, known as River City Ransom, and Street Gangs in the West. Makota basically saw making a game that was too much like Double Dragon as a losing battle waiting to happen. Instead, Makota set out to make a beat-em-up that played similar to a Double Dragon game, but took just as much influence from elsewhere. The Sega employee had previously noticed an absence in the arcade market of any game that really looked or played like Dragon Quest, the popular JRPG that changed everything. This led him to study different source material based around the use of magic and swords. 
Through this period, the project lead would rent a video of Conan the Barbarian and watch it so many times over that the tape would become worn. Further from this, he was also inspired by the Lord of the Rings and would accumulate as many illustrations as possible based on Tolkien's work. This was to use as reference material. In an interview with RetroGamer.net, Makota is quoted to have said, If I could, I would vote Gandalf for president. As you can now see, it was the intense study of high fantasy material from both the East and the West, paired with the gameplay style of Double Dragon, that would ultimately result in Golden Axe's existence. Speaking of high fantasy material, today's video is sponsored by On the Island of Grotesque, a fantasy ebook short story by Australian author Joe Gillam. A young knight named Sir Jasper Austenbury is searching for love. To win the heart of a young maiden, Sir Jasper and his friends will seek wealth and glory on a monster infested island. What they find will change the world, a tale of knights, adventure, beautiful women and monsters. So if you like Golden Axe, then this book may be appealing to you. The book is available on Amazon and Smash Words with a link for these in the description. With regards to Golden Axe itself, the game arrived in the arcades in 1989 and lets players choose from taking control of one or three warriors. These three warriors include a battle axe wielding dwarf known as Gilius Thunderhead, a two-handed broadsword wielding barbarian known as Axe Battler, and a woman who wields a longsword known as Tyrus Flare. Woo. The plot of this two-player cooperative side-scrolling beat-em-up takes place in a land known as Uria, which is based off of all the source material that was mentioned earlier. Within this medieval environment exists an evil entity known as Death Adder. Death Adder has successfully conquered the land of Uria by capturing both the king and the king's daughter by gaining possession of a mythical weapon known as the Golden Axe. The Golden Axe is a magical emblem of Uria and Death Adder has promised to use it to kill the nation's royal family unless the people accept him as their ruler. This leads the game's three heroes to set out to avenge their losses and save their kingdom. All three characters have all lost family members at the hands of this evil entity. The only way to make progress in this game is through hacking and slashing your way through side scrolling environments, slowly eliminating Death Adder's forces. The game sees you traversing across nine different stages that each vary in aesthetics. We will talk about these in more detail shortly, but first, let's quickly run through this game's basic mechanics. In Golden Axe, players have the ability to perform simple attacks using their character's weapons. They also have the ability to jump and can also cast spells. The spell casting, I believe, is a mechanic seen in no beat-em-up game previously and as a result functions in a rather unique way. The strength of the magic spells that can be cast depends on how full the player's magic power bar is, that is located at the top of the screen. These bars can be filled further by collecting magic potions that can be obtained by hitting little sprites that sometimes appear. If the player is successful in doing so, they drop potions for the player to pick up. These characters appear on screen both during regular levels and the bonus stages that occur in between stages. Each of the three playable characters can cast different elemental spells depending on which one you select. These vary from earth spells to lightning and fire. Another unique feature of this beat-em-up is that the game contains creatures known as Bazarians, which are steeds that can be ridden and controlled by the player. These vary in strength and practicality. The weakest of these is the cockatrice that can perform a tail sweeping attack and the strongest are these dragons that can shoot fireballs and breathe fire. Across the game's nine stages the player traverses across mostly woodlands and settlements. Along the way you rescue inhabitants from a ransacked area known as the Turtle Village which soon transpires to actually being situated on a giant turtle shell. This same turtle brings the players across the sea, which soon results in flying to Death Adder's castle itself, on the back of a giant mythical eagle, which features as another one of the game's creative stages. These stages all have a slightly unsettling feel to them, as one would hope for really with a game set within a war-torn land. In the opening stage, apart from the enemies themselves, the backdrops seem to be devoid of life. The ground is bare, and none of the trees appear to feature any leaves whatsoever. 
Life is located when you get to Turtle Village on stage 2, but all of the buildings still look very worn and depressed. This pretty much sets the tone for the entire game, as every stage features these sort of aesthetics. In terms of the hordes of enemies you must wade through in this game, as expected, Death Adder's forces fit the theme of the game very well, and often look like works inspired by Tolkien. Opposition includes armed men wielding clubs and maces, and skeleton warriors who come out of the ground, an idea that appears to have been plucked straight from Jason and the Argonauts. The end of each stage also features a boss encounter. These enemies that wrap up each stage are generally larger than other sprites. They also have more complex attack patterns and can take more damage than regular opponents. In order to beat these without losing lives, this obviously requires a lot of practice with the game. The biggest and baddest of these within the arcade game obviously takes place against Death Adder himself, which is certainly very challenging. I cannot begin to imagine how many coins people would have had to put in these arcade machines back in the day in order to finish this game for the first time, but it must have been very costly. Speaking of the arcade machines, the credit roll itself is pretty amusing as the end scenes of the game feature the game's cast breaking out of the cabinet and into the real world. The enemies run across a cityscape with the game's playable characters in hot pursuit a strange ending for a game set in a high fantasy environment, indeed. The game would obviously be ported over to the Sega Mega Drive later that same year, with the Mega Drive version of this game being most well known out of any version. We will get to discussing more about this one shortly. What some may not know though is that Golden Axe was not released as a Mega Drive exclusive, and instead was ported to a huge range of other platforms as well. I guess this was still a point in time where the only company who were interested in locking games with their system was Nintendo, the very company Sega had set out to slow down in the home console market. Sega were not yet at the point where they were locking their games to their home systems themselves, and instead were publishing many of their games on as many systems as possible. Interestingly, Golden Axe seemed to be released on everything under the sun, with the exception of the Nintendo Famicom. Golden Axe would see release on all of the big home and micro computers of the period, mainly for the benefits of the European marketplace. As you can see, all of these versions of the game look completely different and receive various results in terms of quality. Amongst all of these, obviously the 16-bit versions seem to look the best, but none of the games are even close to the arcade original. An IBM PC compatible version would also see release, which featured pretty choppy scrolling. And in terms of game consoles, the Mega Drive's rival, the PC Engine CD, would even receive its own version. Once again, this version looks like complete shite, but it would feature some fantastic CD quality music at least. All in all, we could try and claim with these versions that this was a big conspiracy to try and make the Mega Drive look more impressive, but in reality, it seems more likely that Sega simply let others use the Golden Axe license when porting the game to non-Sega hardware, hence such varying results in quality. Speaking of other versions of Golden Axe, it would eventually also arrive on the Master System, which although doesn't quite look as good as many of the 16-bit ports, certainly runs a lot smoother. Onto the main event of the Sega Mega Drive, this was the closest port at the time to exist of the arcade original, which makes perfect sense considering the Mega Drive technology was based off of the back of the Sega System 16 arcade board. What I will say about the Mega Drive version is that it features much brighter and more vivid colours than that of the arcade original, which some could argue makes the game look even better, but it does remove the game's depressing feel somewhat, I guess making the change somewhat of a trade-off. In fact, the game is not a direct port at all, and features further differences than what you would expect from an arcade conversion, other than just colours, graphics and musical changes. In the Mega Drive version of Golden Axe, you can actually face Death Adder at the end of Stage 6. However, the game continues through two final dungeon stages until you face off with a secret new last boss, who is Death Adder's mentor known as Death Bringer. Death Bringer's appearance is very similar to Death Adder, but for his purple armour and putrid green skin tone. 
All in all, this change in final opponents equals a nice little surprise for those who started out by playing just the arcade version of this game. On top of the main play mode for the Mega Drive version, the game also offered dual mode, a survival mode which pitted players against increasingly powerful foes in consecutive rounds of play. All in all, the Mega Drive conversion of this game is amazing and one of the first truly great games available for the Sega Mega Drive. The game would arrive in a time period where the system had no Streets of Rage or Sonic the Hedgehogs. So the game stood out as a high quality game amongst the system's library even more then than it does even now. This was the first ever high quality two player cooperative beat em up you could ever play on the system. One of the top genres of games that the Mega Drive is fondly remembered for now. The game's existence in 1989 on the platform presented arguably the first real reason to own a Sega Mega Drive and offered part of the blueprint that would go on to become the Streets of Rage series in the future. And that is without talking about all the sequels that Golden Axe would go on to receive in its own right. For all of these reasons, Golden Axe is an extremely important game and an integral catalyst that played a strong part in the 16-bit console wars. What a great game Golden Axe is. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of Golden Axe. Why not share with us all in the comment section some of your favourite memories with the game. If you enjoyed this video, please do not forget to like and subscribe for multiple videos on gaming history uploaded every week to this very channel. Finally, my channel is partially funded by the generous donations I receive via Patreon. Patrons can earn a credit and a shout out at the end of these videos. These people make working full time on YouTube just that little bit less scary, so I'd like to thank you all very much for that. So huge shout outs go out to Sebastian Veles, Carl Johnson, JD Robbins, Synth Spaces, Andrew Bazanski, Toby Quang DX, Michael Baker, Tom Elliott, Computer Man, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Daniel Daly, Retroversing.com, House of the Ted, Dan Barlow Jr., Joel, and all of my other patrons. Yeah, cheerio.